years ago, when I was pregnant with my first child, my husband and I had just settled in for the night. With all the preparations, tidying, and readying for the baby to be here, we were up late. And by the time that each of us was ready to hit the hay, it couldn't have been earlier than 1.30 a.m. I had just tossed the comforter to the side, ready to wobble my way into my body pillow pregnancy cocoon, when I hear our doorbell ring. My husband walks from our bedroom to the front door, peers out the tiny slit between our curtains and the window, and sees a woman standing out on our porch. He unlocks our wooden door and opens it. Mind you that our security door that is metal never opens up at any point in this interaction, which is the reason why I think hubby felt so comfortable to open the door at that time anyway. Even before saying hello, it was clear that the woman was high and jittery. She looked around nervously before finally asking if she could use our bathroom. Hubby says no and dismissively tells her that this isn't a public restroom. Upon hearing this, the woman was not happy with the response and began pulling and kicking at our security door. Even before her lash out, we both had an awful feeling about this woman and knew that something here just wasn't right. As she pulled and rattled at the handle of our door, I took great pride in the fact that we are a family that religiously locks all doors to our home the moment that we're inside. No reason to ever leave anything to chance is my opinion. My husband tells her that she needs to go and close the wooden door right in her face. But she continued to bang and scream outside of our house, yelling about how she needed to use the bathroom. After a minute or two of this, my husband reopens the door and tells her to piss off or else he's calling the cops. When she hears this, she stopped cold, froze, and for about 20 seconds, just stood on her porch and stared at us before quietly turning around and walking off. A little put off by how she calmed down so quickly and left, we turned off all the lights and again turned to that small opening between our curtains and the window to see where she went. Just outside the frame of what we could easily see from the window, we think we saw her next door, speaking with two other people. I said to my husband there and then that that was the setup for a home invasion. He quickly agreed. The thing was, I'd actually seen this woman around our neighborhood before, and quite a few times at that. I believe that she had seen me too, and it's likely that she knew I was heavily pregnant. I'm thinking that in her mind, that is what may have made us good targets, thinking that if they were able to make it inside, that we would be more compliant. People have a tendency to be that way when they're attempting to protect their family. If I had to guess, I bet she followed me home. Not that I ever got the chance to ask because... I never saw her again after that night. Not even that it needs to be said here, but remember to lock your doors. Don't ever give anyone a chance to get inside. If you stay ready, you'll never have to get ready. Back in 2013, I was living with my ex at the time, who lived near a nice country village. And as I was in between jobs at that point, I picked up a job at a local garden center. It was casual retail work, fairly decent pay, and easygoing enough that I could take coffee breaks frequently and wear basically whatever I liked, as long as I wore my work polo shirt. It was walking distance from my ex's house, and full of people of all ages, who were the most lovely people that I had ever met. Most of the regular customers who came to the garden center were usually sweet old people who would visit the cafe because we had free teas and discounted lunches for seniors if they had a store card. So you often got to know all of them, and some of them we even gave nicknames. Most of them sweet, like Pink Hair Lady, a badass 80-year-old grandma who wore a tasseled leather jacket and bright pink hair. Then there was Camper Van Couple, who used to drive a really cool camper van with bright orange flowers painted on it. You get the idea. With Creepy Artist Man, though, he gave most of the young girls weird vibes. He 
He wore a straw hat, was in his late 40s, and had round gold-rimmed glasses, and would wear strange graphic shirts with naked women on them, or professional p patrol sort of slogans on the back. He always wore ripped jeans, where his knees were always hanging out of them, which were always dirty with paint or mud or something. He had this strange half-smile that would never leave his face, and a kind of leer that made people feel uncomfortable. He would take off his glasses and clean them constantly, which kind of made you feel like he was trying to get a better look at the girls who worked there, especially the younger ones. Anyway, it was a roasting hot summer's day, and I had gratefully accepted the job of watering the hanging baskets outside, where I could avoid the humid, sweaty heat of the greenhouses. I was wearing black shorts and my red polo, as well as my tool belt to prune and deadhead plants as I went. With the hose in my hand and sun on my face, I was busy, but enjoying the solitary job at the quietest part of the garden center. Well, hello there. Out of practically nowhere, he slipped out behind some wooden trellises and looked me up and down, smiling with his weird, too small teeth. His eyes lingered on me for what felt like an uncomfortable few seconds, and I turned off my hose and asked him if he needed anything. He shook his head and kind of shrugged, still smirking at my legs. Me. Okay, sir. Have a nice day. Let me know if you need anything. I turned to continue my job. Him. I've never seen you here before. You're, uh, you're the new one. Me. Huh? Well, I've been here about eight months now, so I don't think I'm new. Him. I must have missed the memo that a beauty like you started. You have a nice tan. You look young. Me. Uh, thanks. I'm 23. Anyway, I have to get back to work. Him. Well, nice to meet you. Before casually stating my entire name. Hearing him say my name slightly irked me. And that's when I suddenly remembered my name badge and get more slightly irritated that he now knew my full name. I make a beeline for the smoking area, where the tool shed was, with an excuse to grab some smaller gardening gloves. And by the time I returned to the floor, creepy artist guy had left. As the weeks went by, he would come into the store pretty regularly, usually mid-afternoon. Coincidentally, or so I thought, around the time that I'd start my shift. Most of the time, I was the only cashier, so I would have to serve him. He would buy the smallest, most pointless things, like floristry wire or a tiny bag of birdseed. It seemed like he would purposely make a purchase with the intention of interacting with me. He would make comments about my appearance, statements mostly like, You have your hair different today. Yesterday you had it down. You have new glasses. Or... That's a different lip color than yesterday. He would always announce my name loudly and deliberately during every interaction. I felt uncomfortable, but I did my best to politely shrug it off. Around Christmas time, I was decorating the artificial trees, and he cornered me in the forest of them at the back of the store. He jumped out from behind one, and it made me jump, to which I was kind of pissed because I dropped a glass ornament and it had smashed. He bent down as well and tried to help by grabbing my wrist and telling me not to touch the glass. His grip was scarily tight and forceful, and his hands were clammy and gross. I slipped my hand out of his grip and asked if there was anything I could help him with. That's when it got weird. He pulled out a leaflet from his back pocket and told me that he was an artist and had a Christmas art show happening at the local church hall, and he wanted me to go with him. He told me that he was a painter, and he thought that I would like his work, which was strange because I had never indicated I was interested in art to him, or anyone else for that matter. I asked him if he wanted me to pin the leaflet to the local event board, and he reached out, touched my arm, and said no. The invitation is specifically for you. He pointed his finger and jammed it right into my breast 
when he said, you. So I'm standing there in a dark corner, obscured from view by artificial Christmas trees, just kind of cornered by this guy who was touching me. I cringed away and said that I was busy with my boyfriend that day, sorry, and kind of scampered off. I remember feeling really strange after that, the fact he grabbed my wrist and jabbed his finger into my chest that way. I told a few of my colleagues about it, and they told me they would warn me the next time he was in the store so I could maybe hang out in the storeroom until he was gone. Well, that memo must have missed a few of the temp Christmas staff, because one day I get told by one, your friend is asking for you at the tills. It wasn't unusual for my friends to stop by as it was fairly popular for gifts, etc. So I was thinking that maybe it was my ex's mom or something like that. So I head to the till, and there he is. He's holding a piece of paper in his hand. I cringed, but he had seen me now, so I walk over and asked what he needed from me. He passed the paper over and asked me to open it. Folded up was a drawing of me with exaggerated breasts and cartoon-like eyes watering the hanging baskets in a rather sexually geared kind of position. I kind of stood there and said thank you, but I couldn't keep it as I thought it was inappropriate to take gifts from customers however weird they may be. I handed it back to him, and he kind of looked at me with this angry stare. He then turned around and walked out of the garden center without another word. By this point, I had had enough. I knocked on my manager's door and told him about the whole scenario that just happened, including all the previous interactions that I had had with that man over the past year. My manager watched the CCTV and agreed that it was so strange the way he gave me this grotesque picture, and told me that he would talk to the man if he ever came back in. My manager praised me for my reaction to his advances, and said I was doing the right thing, and that he would try to see him off the next time. The next day was a Sunday, and I wasn't due to work. My boss calls me, and tells me he just received a call from headquarters, stating that an anonymous caller had called in to report a staff member inappropriately coming on to a customer. The staff member they had described and named was me. The caller had said that I had been inappropriate towards him at work, offered to have sex with him, had led him on, and was obviously promiscuous, that I had been pursuing him for over a year. The jerk even described a fictitious relationship we had had and ranted loudly about how I had been cheating on my boyfriend before hanging up. HQ didn't believe a word as my manager had already mentioned the guy to one of the higher-ups, but they thought it was wise to let me know about this crazy guy and suggest I report it to the police. The next day, I did just that. The officer I spoke to said that that man matched the description of a guy who was a local pest, somebody who would often harass young girls in the local area. He was also known to stalk girls in his car and had attempted to abduct a young girl four years ago. The police officers assured me that they would file a report and talk to him officially, and that he was not allowed in the garden center or anywhere near me again. And if he were to show up again, that I was to call the police, and he would be promptly arrested. Unfortunately, though, it didn't stop him from sending a ranting letter to my workplace addressed to me, saying that he would off himself if I didn't take him back and receive his gift that he drew for me. Fortunately, the police saw this as an unsolicited form of contact, and that man was thankfully arrested. So, one more time, creepy artist guy, let's not meet, ever, again. Being that the story is over a decade old now, I no longer live in the area and don't work at that garden center. So, suffice it to say, unless something were to go terribly wrong. I won't be meeting Creepy Artist Guy ever again. This happened a few years back, when I was around 20 or so. I was hanging out with my buddy Matt at my apartment, located in the downtown area of a medium-sized Midwestern city. We were drinking whiskey, watching comedies, playing tunes, when he mentions that he has a close friend, Emily, 
who used to live in my apartment building with her mother. She now lives across the street from me, and he thought that it would be a swell idea if we met, because apparently, we are very similar, and I was single and ready to mingle at that point in my life. He rings her cell and tells her to drop by my place. She arrived at my apartment, and I instantly became fond of her. She was hilarious, pretty, and a musician just like me. She was around 30, so maybe 10 years older than me. My friend Matt was 35. I've always had friends that were much older for some reason. We played songs together and laughed hysterically for hours. Matt eventually decided to go home, leaving us two alone. We chilled for a while longer, ended up making out, and I got all of her contact info before she told me she's going home and that we should meet up again soon. Over the next few weeks, we develop a strong relationship and hang out almost daily. I would throw some pajamas on and walk across the street and we'd get wasted and watch movies. It was actually pretty awesome. After arriving home from a 10-day trip to New York City, things started to get really weird. The day I returned, she asked if she could come by, so I unpacked my stuff and told her to stop in. She rings the buzzer takes the elevator seven floors up to my apartment, and lets herself in. I was talking nonstop about all of the awesome things I did and people I met in New York City, and I could immediately tell that she didn't want to hear any of it. She would change the subject every time I brought it up, and eventually she just flat out said, Can you stop talking about New York? I really don't give a f I was surprised to hear her speak like this. The Emily that I had been getting to know was not like this at all. She was caring, and passionate, and an amazing person, or so I thought. Fast forward a few nights later, I had just gotten home from working a 12-hour shift, and I collapse in bed, ready to pass out for the night. It's about 10 p.m., and I get a text from Emily that says, Hey, what's up? I don't feel much like replying at the moment. I'm too exhausted, and our last hangout was a little too weird for me to comprehend, so I'm still trying to decide how to deal with that. I plug my phone into charge, turn the lights off, and fall asleep effortlessly. I wake up to someone pounding on my door and screaming at the top of their lungs. Open the f***ing door. Let me in. Now. My entire apartment reeks like cigarette smoke. I grab my phone from beside my bed, my heart beating a million miles per hour. 27 missed phone calls a bunch of text messages, all from Emily. I scan through the text while she's still at the door screaming, trying to break my door down. The most recent text from her is a long one, claiming that I'm a piece of sh** for not responding to her text earlier, and that she's coming over to beat the sh** out of me for not doing so. She had a key to the building still, from when she used to live there. I get out of bed, nearly having a panic attack, and try to decide what my next move should be. Should I open the door and calm her? Should I call the police? Should I just ignore her? I decide to open the door. She instantly begins wailing on me, swinging her arms around, trying to hit me. She was smoking a cigarette, and there were three cigarette butts on the ground next to her. She was obviously on some sort of drug. She kept screaming at me, telling me how awful I am for not responding to her text, slurring her speech, and losing her balance in the process. I was somehow able to calm her down, and I took her to the roof of the apartment building, which had a pretty nice little enclosed picnic table area. We sat beside one another. She was quiet now. Finally. She kept asking me how I could be such an asshole, and that I needed to explain myself to her. The look in her eyes was pure evil, and she spoke to me in a calm demeanor now. I said to her, Emily, I don't ever want to speak to you again after tonight. This whole scenario is absolutely insane. You need help. Let me walk you home. I get her home and return to my apartment to attempt sleeping, at which I don't succeed. A couple of days later, I return home from work, and there's an envelope taped to my door. I open it, and it's a handwritten letter from Emily, apologizing and saying that I'm a beautiful human who doesn't deserve an evil person like her in their life. There was a literal candy bar attached to the envelope, 
one that I had never heard of. She always told me that I needed to try. I never spoke to her again. From what Matt tells me, which, by the way, he always knew that she was a problematic person. She is a heavy user of crack now and is working as a food runner in a restaurant nearby. Emily, let's not meet again, for the love of God. <laughs>